This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Thank you, John. Actually, Biondo does come in there in the middle. <laughs> um, as I'll explain. <coughs> So today I plan to follow my topic, when and where and why and how Plutarch's Roman Questions was read and used in the 15th century by singling out a series of individual figures, some of the who's. The young aristocrat Francesco Barbaro, later to be an important humanist and statesman in Venice in 1414 to 16, the teacher Gian Pietro da Venza in Venice in 1453, Biondo Flavio in Rome in the 1450s, Giovanni Calfurnio probably in Venice in about 1477, and Angelo Poliziano in Florence in 1482. Thus we capture the first evidence of knowledge of the work, the first translation published and eventually printed, and this occupied the field until Wilhelm Willander's Latin translation of the Moralia in 1570. The first extensive use of this translation in Biondo Flavio's Roma Triumphans, and a second significant moment when the two prime sources for Roman religion, Roman questions and Ovid's Fasti, were brought together. Other figures of great cultural importance could also be mentioned as readers or owners of texts of Roman questions, especially after the printing of Gian Pietro's translation. For the moment, to keep the story as clean as I can, I'll let them lurk in the footnotes. One cannot be suppressed, the unavoidable and long-lived Guarino Veronese. Not only was he one of the most prolific translators of Plutarch in the earlier decades of the 15th century, translating essays from the Moralia as well as lives, but he had close connections with my first three figures, most of whom knew the others personally. Guarino taught Francesco Barbara and Vittorino da Feltre. Vittorino da Feltre in turn taught Gian Pietro da Venza, Gian Pietro is also included among Guarino's students, and he wrote a poem on the death of Francesco Barbaro. Guarino's letters provide evidence of scholarly collaboration with Biondo, and Barbaro's of friendship with Biondo, and of course, Guarino. We know less of Gian Pietro's contacts. Guarino composed a poetic epitaph for him, and Biondo whether he knew him in person or not, praises him in his Italy Illuminated as being an ornament to Luca. Initially, Roman questions may have become known as a school text. Guarino translated Roman questions for his students, as Gian Pietro did later for his. Guarino's translation can't be dated, but may belong to the 1420s or 30s. One copy survived the Second World War and is still in a place in Poland whose name I can't pronounce. It was once Breslau. And this is um, a Radiger manuscript entitled Guarino Quidam Antiquitatis Monumenta and presumably it was collected by Thomas Radiger during his travels in Italy in 1567-69. According to Sabadini, this contains a translation of about 50 sections from the 113 of the Roman questions. Another, in an Oxford manuscript, Bywater 38, has 84 sections of Roman questions attached to another work of Guarino called the Commentariola. And I have seen these thanks to Fabio Stock. And there's another manuscript in Bologna which contains fewer. The Oxford and Polish manuscripts begin in the same way. For Plutarch's first question, 
which is on the handout, just to give people who may be unacquainted with the Roman questions an idea of what a Roman question looks like. Anyway, the first question is, why did they bid, or why do they bid the bride touch fire and water? And by water 38 translates this as quam obrem sponsai, ot inyem aquam where contingat dum maritum adit imperare solet. And according to Christella's informant, Radio 376 begins with quam obrem sponsa inyem aquam where contineat dum maritum adit. Well, it's easy to amend that so that it corresponds exactly to what's in Bywater 38. In 1414-15, Guarino was in his mid-40s working in Venice as a private teacher. On his arrival there, he stayed in the house of the rich noble Francesco Barbaro, Barbaro who was 24. And in his letter, Grigio's words, Precolce come pochi altri, which is rather wonderful. In this first period, Guarino taught him Greek, and we know that a common interest was Plutarch's lives, predating their meeting. Guarino's translations of the life of Dio and the synchrosis between Dio and Brutus, 1414, were dedicated to Barbaro, who a little before had given him a manuscript of the lives. Soon after, between 1415 and the summer of 1416, Barbaro himself translated a couple of lives. In 1415, he went to Florence, where he became a friend of Cosimo's brother, Lorenzo di Giovanni de Medici. In honour of Lorenzo's marriage in 1416, Barbaro dedicated to him his treatise De Rexoria. It would be interesting to discuss the cultural significance of this work, but here we must confine ourselves to its impressive range of sources, Greek as well as Latin, not all of which Barbara found for himself, Guarino being his acknowledged guide. The sources include some of Plutarch's lives and moralia, for example, Praecepta Conjugalia and De Amore Prolis, and, as Sabadini first noted, Roman questions. Barbara begins the seventh section of Book One, which is, um, in modern editions, it's called De Pompeii. By explaining that in the first part, he will present a few things, yam obsoleta et quasi obliferata, that is dug out from the ancient sources. Why he's doing this is because he thinks that there are good reasons behind the ancient precepts and therefore the ancient precepts should not be neglected. Um, the passage on the handout from De Re Uxoria. The ancient institutions um, in this section include elements of the wedding ceremony, such as the cry of salutation, Talassius the carrying of the bride over the threshold and the prohibition of marrying virgins, but not widows, on the days of February, all of which included among the questions on marriage scattered through Roman. Some of them are found in forms in other works of Plutarch better known at the time, or in other authors, and Barbara not only phrases, but put several sources together. Nevertheless, I believe that the three customs just mentioned do attest knowledge. In particular, what he makes of Roman questions one. Now, the business about brides and fire and water is mentioned in other sources such as Festus and Servius. But nowhere does anyone say as explicitly as in Barbaro's version that the bride touches fire and water. And you can see from the translation of Plutarch that that is the question. So if 
Favreau's um, version of it is even more explicit than in Guarino's translation because he uses contingat uh, that you can see on the handout in the second passage from the De Re Usoria that he's got there. Ante sponsam aquam et ignem de ferry et abea utrunque tangi mos wood. So De Re Uxoria is evidence both of early acquaintance with Roman question on the part of both Guarino. But it's very interesting that almost as soon as it appears, it's being used in a new work. If you turn over the page, you'll see that I've got um, Guarino's translation of the first que Roman question. And down the bottom of the page, I've also got Gian Pietro d'Avenza's translation with lines, um, with underlining. I haven't got time to do a proper comparison of those translations. Um, if I did, I would be pointing out how it's probable that Gian Pietro had a copy of Guarino's translation too. We now move on to that. As we've seen, this was the only one in print until the mid-16th century. He undertook his translation, it seems, without any particular interest in the work's contents. Though it does fit very well into the historical antiquarian current that has been discerned among the early Plutarchan translations. He does see some appeal in its erudition, but he doesn't specially recommend the work as an important source of otherwise unobtainable antiquarian information. Gian Pietro's own predilection was for oratory. Maria Cortesi, and she's practically the only person who's had any interest so far in this translation and in Gian Pietro. She's drawn attention to a long speech in praise of oratory delivered by Gian Pietro in his old age and recorded by a student. As she says, the speech elaborates traditional material on the validity and utility of oratory but it's permeated by a strong sense of personal commitment. And in the middle of the page there, there's an extract from this speech in praise of eloquence. Quid ergo praestabilios eloquentia? Si quidem ceteris artibus sublatis vita maneat? Hark una remota Omnia sint muta et velut in tenebris excellentio o bruta conticescant, nihil agator, nihil communicator. Manuscripts of two of his speeches survive, one addressed to Gian Maria of Sforza and one addressed to the Venetians on contemporary politics. There's also a translation of Isocrates' Encomium of Helen. Of the many other translations made from Greek that Gian Pietro refers to at the beginning of the dedicatory letter of the questions, there's no trace. And in fact, he tells us there that it was his policy not to circulate them. His reluctance to publish his translation of Roman questions, I'm calling it Roman questions for convenience, but in fact it was both Roman and Greek stems partly from its style. This becomes clear in the envoi to the work where he twice uses the adjective tenuous and once humilis to describe it. It's not a work which calls for display of the sort of superior ability in Latin, which in the proem he claims in a lengthy apology not to have. He had undertaken the translation well executationis causa, well discipulorum meorum rogatu. And he's only publishing it out of gratitude to his dedicatee Lorenzo Zane. 
a young Venetian noble who was grandnephew of Eugene the Fourth. Not many prefaces of translations from the Moralia survive. <coughs> We're lucky to have Gian Pietros, and the passage in which he introduces the work itself is interesting for the take he has on it. So, move on to the next passage on the handout, and I'll pick out a few things um, from it, and I apologise for the few typos that I saw last night. Now, um, starting off, Plutarchus igitur Aristotelum credo imitatus. He says there at the beginning that, that he supposes that Plutarchus is imitating Aristotle. Aristotle, in many books, went um, through different, discussed um, different and um, many subtle things. But Plutarch, in one little book, talked about de ritibus consuetudine moribus maiorum tam graecorum quam latinorum. Then he goes on to pick up this point about it imitating Aristotle's problemata. And he actually quotes a bit there from Aristotle's topica on what problema was. Then... Um, goes on to apologise for the nature of the work, saying that it's not going to give the reader much pleasure. But we can balance against the lack of pleasure the fact that it's useful for scholars. And there may be one point in which it, you can squeeze a bit of pleasure out of it, and that is that it shows variety. And then finally... Um, and a sort of secret um, of scholars. It's very sweet to know not only um, things that are not only hidden and recondite, but things that most people don't know about. <laughs> Our habit of referring to Roman questions and Greek questions, Aetia Romaica Chi Hellenica, obscures the fact that for a long time the works circulated jointly under the title Problemata. I'm not quite clear where this title came from, but it both reflects and encourages assimilation to pseudo-Aristotle's Problemata. Indeed, in a series of editions from 1488 to 9, Plutarch's work was combined in print with Aristotle's and pseudo-Alexander of Aphrodisius problemata. In Gian Pietro's dedication copy, the title is Plutarchi Problemata, Ides de Ritibus Consuetudine Maiorum. When describing the work, Gian Pietro gives most emphasis to its belonging to the genre of question and answer works. There were a great number of these not only elsewhere in Plutarch and in the tradition descending from Aristotle's problemata in antiquity, but also in the Christian and medieval tradition. Rose, too, says the general form of the work is borrowed from the Aristotelian problemata. Another feature that Gian Pietro singles out is varietas, a quality of the miscellany, another influential genre of antiquity that Teresa Morgan has helped us to understand better. The form of questions does seem to require explanation. There's no paratext and the work consists entirely of questions. The question to be answered is followed by answers themselves formulated as questions. Questions on particular topics seem to be scattered throughout the work. There are two common reactions to this, both of which began in the 15th century. To ignore the question form and extract the nugget of information. And to excerpt and collect questions on a particular topic, such as weddings and marriage, temples, Saturn, Roman priests or the calendar. It was not only to scholars of the 15th century who worked and thought with excerpts that the work has appeared to be a collection of excerpts. 
Ward Fowler explained the seemingly haphazard organisation by suggesting that Plutarch is often led on in this work from one question to another by something he finds in the book he is consulting for the first. The date of Gian Pietro's letter of dedication is 1453. It would be helpful to know how long before that he composed the translation and how wide it circulated. Today, only three manuscripts survive that predate the printed edition. Apart from the dedication copy, there's Fat Lat 1947, a library copy, which contains a stemma of a cardinal Barbo, most probably Pietro, who became Paul II in 1464. Here, Questions is accompanied by an antiquarian work by Andrea Fiocchi, De Potestatibus Romanis. Possibly this means it's now being classified by the nature of its content, not its form. Fiocchi's work is an important forerunner of Biondo's Roma Triumphans, to which we will soon come. Since it contains a chronological survey of Roman priests and magistrates in serial order. Fiocchi himself did not know Roman questions. The third is collected with five other items in Vatlat 1889, mostly religious. And this is a working copy on paper and much annotated. We now come to the historian and antiquarian Biondo Flavio. In fact, it was through working on the sources of the first two books of his Roma Triumphans that I came to be interested in this topic. Biondo's Roma Triumphans, composed in the 1450s, is a massive exposition of Roman public and private institutions, divided into ten books with five overarching topics, religion, public administration, the army, private institutions and the triumph. Biondo's modus operandi, this is important to understand what I'm saying, um, is to marshal passages from ancient authors to elucidate his topics. Biondo always cites his Greek sources in Latin translation. And when I noticed that he was using Roman questions, I then wanted to find out whose translation he was using. It was obviously it was Gian Pietro's. Before Biondo, there's little surviving evidence of the use of Roman questions. Its absence from Fiocchi, where it would be so relevant, is probably telling. After Biondo, it couldn't be ignored. And between 1444 and 1459, there's a remarkable change in Biondo's use of Plutarch, partly owing to the nature of the works concerned. In Rome Restored, his work on the topography and monuments of Rome, he doesn't use Plutarch at all. In Italy Illuminated, his historical geography of Italy, the lives are cited a few times. In Roma Triumphans, the latest of the three, Roman questions becomes the most important Greek source. Citations of it outnumbering those of the lives put together and of course he uses the lives more too, and way ahead of any other Greek author. Um, but I have to put in a footnote here, which is that not all relevant Greek authors had been translated by then. In the lives too, he's naturally drawn to information on Roman religious, social, and institutional practices. Biondo uses those questions which information not to be found elsewhere, but of course he couldn't easily know that. But he sometimes chooses Plutarch in preference to Livy or Varro. One way of understanding Biondo's enthusiasm for this source is to compare what it offered with information already available in Latin authors. Take the topic of Roman priests. One of the most ancient was the Flamen Dialis, whose role was, to quote Rose, marked by a series of curious and complicated rites. These are collected and listed in all 
Atlas Gellius 10.5, but briefly. And um, on the handout, you can see that Aulus Gellius just says, Farinum fermento in butam ad tingere e fascinon est. Then we have the Roman question, why was it not permitted for the priests of Jupiter, whom they call the Flamen Dialis, to touch either flour or yeast, with various attempts to answer the question. And we turn over and we see um, how this comes out in Roma Triumphans. And he's able to say a bit more than he would have got from Aulus Gellius and suggest a reason. So as we can see from that, Biondo doesn't ignore the explanations in the questions but he tends to present only one explanation as the reason. He also excerpts and bunches together questions on specific topics. For example, in his books on religion, Biondo cites nearly all of the sections of Roman questions that have to do with the Flam and Dialis. So 44, 50, 109 and 112 are together in book 2 and 111 and 13 are together in book 1. But as I've said, Roman questions as a whole was useful to him and appears frequently in the later books of Roma Triumphans too. Not only did Roman questions contain the historical antiquarian information that Biondo wanted, but it came in an easy to use form that would have appealed, already excerpted as it were. This is a demonstration that Peter and Miller is right to say that what matters in the history of antiquarianism are questions and tools. Biondo has found a work that is not only a tool, but the questions of which seem to echo his own. When I raised the question of the date when Gian Pietro's translation became available, I was looking ahead to Biondo. Mazzocco has argued from a report of a conversation between Biondo and Francesco Barbaro, who died in 1454. This report is in Roma Triumphans Book 9. That Roma Triumphans must have been well underway in its basic structure plan by the end of 1453. But this wouldn't have given him much time to integrate Roman questions if it became available after April 1453, the date of its letter of dedication. But it wouldn't have been difficult for Biondo to hear of and obtain the translation, perhaps from Guarino or from Barbaro. The fact that he makes no special reference to the translator, whom he at least knew by reputation, suggests that the work is by now a common possession. And in the ensuing decade, it certainly became one, and therefore a likely candidate for printing. And um, the, the printing is itself an interesting episode, but I think I'd better skip over that, apart from saying that it, it, um, it's an in, there's an interesting conjunction of the printer uh, the humanist editor and later professor of, at Padua, known as Giovanni California, and the dedicatee of the volume, the Venetian patrician Marco Aurelio. In the dedicatory letter of the Editio Princeps, Calfonio reveals that he'd approached his Venetian patron asking if he had a copy of Plutarch's Problemata. The latter replied that he'd seen it and read it, but because the text was bad in a number of places, he'd not kept it in his library. When Calfonio received from the printers a text in the same state, he thought that Gian Pietro's effort in translating the work should not go to waste, so he corrected it from a copy in Greek. He now offers the printed copy as a suitable addition to Aurelio's library. How does Calfonio present the work itself? He no longer thinks it important to explain the form or apologise for the style. 
it's simply a useful source of antiquarian learning. And that's um, on the last page of the handout. Opusculum quod certe eruditionis plenum, et ad percipiendos plures ritus per utile legentibus consevitur. The next major episode in the reception of Roman questions comes soon after the appearance of the printed edition. And this is in 1480 to 1482. At this point, two of the most important surviving works on Roman religion were brought together. And I interject here that my emphasis is on the word Roman and that I include under the hard to define term religion popular practices and beliefs that moderns might label superstitions or para-religious. Three commentaries on Ovid's Spasti were written about this time, all based on teaching or university lecturing, respectively by Paolo Marci, Antonio Costanzi and Poliziano. Marci is a product of his teaching at the Roman Studium in the 1470s, was published in 1482, and Costanzi's not until 1489, though his manuscripts dated 1480. This manuscript was presented to Federigo da Montefeltro for the use of his son, and the dedication contains an interesting justification for the study of a work on pagan religion. Understanding the veneration the misguided Romans devoted to their gods will arouse more fervor for right religion. And Biondo had made a similar apology for his presentation of Roman religion in Roma Triumphans. Poliziano's commentary was not published, but his course is dated 1481 to 82. After his death, his student Pietro Crinito included the manuscript with other such teaching commentaries in a Zibaldone, now in Munich. All of these commentaries draw regularly on questions, Poliziano's most of all. But unlike Marci and Costanzi, he doesn't quote from the available Latin translation. He mixes his own beautiful translations with citations of the Greek text. He too rearranges the material into blocks. For example, on Fasti 221 Flamine, he quotes questions 40, 44, 50, and 109 to 113. That is all the questions that have to do with the Flamin Dialis. And in the course of this section, he criticizes Gian Pietro's incorrect translation of Roman questions 112 and beyond over following it. Ovid's Fasti is an ideological poem that uses a calendrical framework to talk about ancient customs and rites. Underlying it is the same kind of antiquarian research as Plutarch uses and some of the same sources, Varro and Various. Ovid, especially in Book 1, uses questions and answers to present antiquarian information. And in one case, Fasti 1, 229 to 30, his question coincides with Plutarch's 41. As questions has a good deal to say about the calendar and some of the Roman festivals, it must have seemed particularly relevant to early commentators on Ovid's Fasti. Marcy's commentary was frequently reprinted in the 16th century, and this is another route that ensured that Rome, Plutarch's Roman questions was kept before a wider cultivated public. It was, for example, the one used in Shakespeare in England. We can't attribute the beginnings of Renaissance antiquarianism to Roman questions alone, but we can claim it played an important part, especially in the study of Roman religion. At about the tail end of the age of late humanism, we meet a Roman questions again, but the similarity of the new work with its Plutarchan model is rather remote. In 1637, a young professor of rhetoric at Leiden, only 25 at the time, published Quaestiones Romanae Quibus Sacri et Profani Ritus Eurumque Causae et Origines, etc. 
It consists of 47 new Christiones Romanae, often to do with the interpretation of religious references in inscriptions. But they're little interpretative essays attached to a question, not questions answered with a question, in the Plutarchan style. The volume includes Plutarch's work with Zillinger's Latin translation, an early love. Marcus Zuerius van Boxhorn, the author, moved on from these beginnings to become an important figure in the early history of Indo-European linguistics. Still later in the century, his Quaestiones was considered, considered significant enough to be included in Volume 5 of Gravis's 12 volume, The Zauros Antiquitatum Romanorum. As far as I can see, this ends the first crucial moment of Roman questions reception, during which it came to be regarded as a key source for the new discipline of antiquarianism. The second, when Plutarch's compilation was rediscovered and redefined by the folklorists and comparative religionists at the end of the 19th century, is another story. Thank you.